Tina Koto. As you heard, I'm Rebecca Clark. I work at Toitu Te Whenua and I am uh, in the data publishing team and am the uh, product owner for the aerial imagery publication. Oh, I've got to figure out how to use this. Oh, there we go. Did it work? But I think it's there. there. we go. Great. So before we begin, I thought a good question to answer is, what is aerial imagery processing for LINS? LINS has an aerial imagery collaboration program with um, councils and regional consortiums where we work with them to get imagery every year of New Zealand. That imagery is captured by many suppliers, and when it comes to us, it's not consistent between suppliers. So we go about checking for issues, applying cut lines we needed, and, oh, sorry, standardizing the imagery so there's consistent naming, tile sizes, and projection, and compression. Then it's saved as cloud-optimized geotiffs, and stack metadata is applied to every, every tile. Previous, previously, before we moved to the cloud, we received imagery by drives, plugged them into our computer, and would run heaps of GDAL commands and Python scripts. This relied heavily on how well our computers could handle it, the storage capacity and the performance capacity. This sometimes took up to a month to two months to publish imagery onto base maps of the LINS data service. I'll hand over to Alice now, who will talk more about um, getting our imagery processing up into the cloud. Thanks, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Um, so I'm Alice Fage. I'm a geospatial developer. Um, so the topographic data engineering team, which is the team I'm in, we were formed in 2020 and we were a full team from 2021. We were formed to cloudify the QA and image standardization processes, which has moved the, the grunty part of the workflow into the cloud. In fact, we've moved it all into the cloud now, pretty much. Um, we're an agile team with three full-time developers. We share a product owner, solutions architect, and scrum master with the base maps team. Um, and Rebecca is our subject matter expert for imagery, because she's the imagery product owner. AWS is our hosting platform, so that's what we uh, built the solution on top of. So we wanted to find a solution that could speed up our processing and remove the bottlenecks that we'd identified and make it reusable for future use, which is for us at the moment different types of uh, data sets. So it might be elevation data in the future. And we wanted to get the imagery out with a faster turnaround. Uh, we created an initial proof of concept in AWS Batch, just to see how it worked. And it worked well for speeding up the processing part, but it did need to be improved so that it was easier to use in terms of submitting the workflows, the jobs, and so that we had something to manage all those different jobs if we were submitting multiple jobs. And we also needed more flexibility, which is like passing the output of one processing step to another one or doing conditional processing based on what we're getting in. So in May 2022, we took a couple of sprints to evaluate some open source workflow and orchestration solutions, and we selected Argo workflows running on Kubernetes. And we all worked together, and by October, the, October 2022, we had a working implementation on AWS, and Rebecca was receiving bulk imagery, some really quite big data sets, uploading them, and processing them through our solution on AWS. And that little picture there is of a successful workflow, workflow run as it was in October 2022. It's a bit more complicated these days, but that's what it looked like then. Our infrastructure um, uses Docker. Obviously, it runs on a lot of containers. Um, we use the GDAL container, um, and we program mostly in Python and TypeScript. So it's Python for the imagery stuff and TypeScript more for infrastructure and helper functions. Um, our Go workflows is running for us on AWS EKS. So that is, I wouldn't call that an open source platform particularly, but you could run it on standard Kubernetes. Um, we use EC2 spot instances to save money. 
Uh, the disadvantage is sometimes AWS grabs them back from us, but that just means we have to make sure that we can rerun our workflows um, because that really is an awful lot cheaper way of doing things and it just scales up and down as you need it. We deploy it using AWS CDK, so it's all infrastructure as code. Uh, the workflows are YAML, so they're quite uh, easy to read. I think you all know the benefits of open source, but for us, the main benefits, I think, in this point were that we were able to try proof of concepts, get them up and running really quickly and see what worked and what didn't work. We didn't waste time watching PowerPoints about products. We used our time actually trying them out. Um, and we were able to make our repositories open and we can also contribute to the projects that we work with just so we can give back. And we really, as a government organization, really want to make everything open and use open formats, open standards and make our data open. So back in February 2023, our solution was uh, that it was still quite in the early days, but it was working. We were still learning about it. We were still working on scaling it and resilience of the solution. We had some configurable parameters that were really useful. Um, and we had our code in GitHub repos so that we could share it between us. And we didn't have to, you know, it was really easy to work on it all together. So the picture that I've got there with the orange box, that's the bit that Andrew's going to talk about next. And that is the core of our standardization process that runs um, on GDAO Docker containers. Um, kia ora, I'm Andrew. I'm a uh, geospatial developer in the Base Maps team at Teams. Uh, so just a quick recap for people who might be from overseas. Um, cyclone Gabriel was a, a severe tropical cyclone that uh, hit the North Island of New Zealand in early February this year and was caused widespread flooding and property and property damage and loss of life in the uh, Gisborne or Tarapiti region as well as the Hawke's Bay region in the North Island and it was the costliest cyclone in New Zealand's history. So Linz's role in emergency responses such as that is to coordinate uh, and publish imagery that is acquired by other government agencies or other people who are working on the response. Uh, and some of that uh, aerial imagery that we captured there or, or that we published was used by councils to determine how to reach communities that had been cut off to find where roads were impassable. Uh, it was used by the forestry industry to understand the, the loss to their forests. It was used by different ground research institutes to uh, map landslides and yeah, so we, you can see there we received or we published three different types of imagery. So there was the Sentinel satellite imagery that a lot of people will be familiar with. It is, covers a really wide area, but it's only a 10 meter resolution for getting a sort of broad overview of what's going on. It's great, but it just doesn't really give you that like detail of exactly what's happened on the ground. At the very other end of the spectrum, there were some aerial surveys that were flown at uh, for the data that we received 10 centimeter resolution, which is uh, general sort of urban spec imagery. That's really fantastic imagery, but there's a limited amount that you can fly in a given amount of time for particularly in a disaster response where you need to get that imagery out as quickly as possible. So then the key thing for us that we're going to talk about today was the ability to access uh, high resolution satellite imagery. So that was at 50 centimeter resolution over uh, most of the North Island as you see on the next slide. And so that's slightly lower resolution than what we generally get for uh, rural aerial imagery capture, but it was over that whole area. So that was quite a game-changing thing for us. And that was acquired uh, through a sort of cross-government consortium. So there was uh, LIMS, MPI, NEMA, and then the Hawke's Bay Regional Council and Gisborne District Council. Uh, so this is the area that we received. So it's most of the, or well, it was all of the area of interest of the eastern part of the North Island, so it's just a bit over 50,000 kilometers. Uh, but this data was quite different than what we're used to uh, receiving and publishing. Uh, so normally we would get from a survey company, we would just get pretty finalized data that's close to what we'd uh, want to put out. There's going through some standardizing to make sure it's consistent between different suppliers, but broadly it's just uh, standardized into a new format and publish it out and then do some QC on it. On the other hand, the satellite imagery, we got three different types of product. There was the L1 product, which was pretty raw as to what you get from the satellite. It hadn't been auto-rectified. 
Then there was the L3C where that had been auto-rectified and pan-sharpened to a 16-bit RGBI imagery. And then there was the L3D where that 16-bit RGBI had been mapped down to an 8-bit RGB. We looked at that L3D and thought, hey, that looks pretty similar to the stuff that we normally do. Let's just pop that through the workflow and see what we get. And unfortunately, the output wasn't that great. Uh, so the colorization that you can see is not particularly natural looking. Uh, there's also significant differences between image tiles that when you mosaic it together, it almost looks like a kind of tartan pattern. It just wasn't going to be particularly usable for what we wanted. So we decided to then go back up one step and go to the 16-bit L3C. Uh, we looked at sort of a the histograms from a representative sample of images from different parts of the, the survey to um, identify then uh, where we wanted to put our black and white points, just broadly analogous to using a levels command in Photoshop or GIMP or similar, to then map that 16-bit space down to an 8-bit, that we could apply those consistent values across every image tile. Uh, so then that's what we got out the other end, and this is eventually what we then published. So you can see it's overall, the overall appearance is just much more natural looking. There are some differences between image tiles. It's not perfect, but for what we were able to get out in like a day, uh, it was a much more improved product. There were also some sort of less ideal bits with the, the colorization, particularly in deep shadows. We were getting sort of a blue color cast that if we corrected that, it made some other things worse. So we were just like, you know what, we're just gonna live with that, that's fine. Um, so we learned a lot from this. Uh, it was incredibly valuable, the speed that we could get with the cloud processing. It meant that one run of that processing, that full 50,000 square kilometer, 50 centimeter imagery, would take about an hour in the cloud, maybe a bit less than that. And so we could just uh, quickly try out different parameters, see what that would look like, look at it across the whole survey. Um, the base maps previews, which if we've got a slide that Rebecca will talk to, uh, was incredibly valuable as well. So the output that we get from that standardization is a series of COGS, cloud optimized geotiffs, that can then be loaded into the base map service to just spin up a web map of just that processing run output. And so then that's uh, a URL that can be shared around the team and everybody can just be, you just post it on Slack and everybody's just diving in and looking and finding different problems and then identifying what we need to do for a rerun again or okay, actually to get sort of approval is this, can we pu push this out to to the the people who are working on the response in the Hawke's Bay and Gisborne. Uh, there were some optimizations for the infrastructure, uh, improved scaling to allow jobs to just get bigger or be smaller if whatever is needed, as well as improving uh, retries so that something that if it failed for sort of transient issues, which we would occasionally get, uh, it'll just automatically retry so the whole job doesn't fail if one particular part of it does. And then also some options that we didn't explore with this, but we just learned a whole bunch about dealing with 16-bit imagery, whereas everything else we've done in the past has always just been 8-bit. So there's a whole lot of possibilities for there to bring that sort of that richness of that, that spectral data down to um, when we're actually just publishing it out as a standard 8-bit web map. Thank you. So this diagram is where we are at today with our processing. We have the flying companies uploading imagery directly to an S3 bucket via SFTP. Then the yellow person there is an analyst like myself who would then submit a workflow from the command line or user interface and it will go through Argo. Once it's been through Argo and standardised, we get a notification in Slack providing us with a link to a web map to go visually QC the imagery. This web map is what Andrew mentioned before. Here we can go look for any anomalies or defects, and we have handy little tools in the corner to slide between this imagery and what's currently on the base map. We can also um, check the tile boundaries, zoom in and out really fast, uh, see the whole data set as a whole. We've got WMTS as well to bring it into our um, GIS application to uh, analyze it against vector data. We can provide this URL uh, to, the, to other people to look at the imagery. We're doing this with councils at the moment. Uh, some of them are using it for their pre-acceptance checks of imagery before they accept it from the supplier. 
Another cool thing about this is they can begin utilising the imagery from that point instead of waiting for it to be published on the LINS data service or LINS base maps. Go back to this diagram. Once we're saying it's okay, the visual check, we have another analyst, uh, not another Alice, another analyst, uh, that isn't myself, <laughs> who then uh, we do a published workflow and that analyst will uh, review the pull request that's uh, created to review the stack metadata in the imagery, approve it and it'll be published to the NZ Imagery S3 bucket, which is also on the AWS registry of open data. Moving to the cloud has meant that we process imagery much faster now. We can discover defects faster, fix them faster, try out new things faster. We have less corruption because our drives aren't plugged into our machines for long periods of time, so no interruption. We have less physical infrastructure, no drives, no meeting machines, and I can work from New Plymouth instead of being plugged into a drive down in Wellington. For the customers, we're getting quicker publication, so once we start working on it, we've gone from one to two months down to one to two weeks. All our content is standard, standardised across all data sets, and we also have that NZ Imagery S3 bucket, where you can go to download whole data sets instead of 15 gigabyte batches on the LINS data service. So feel free to go and take a look for yourself on LINS base maps or the LINS data service, and there's a link to the uh, S3 bucket if you'd like to take a look. And GitHub repos as well that are open, which are accessible for you to have a look around as well. Oh, that one? <laughs> Uh, if you have any questions uh, further on, you can email this email address or we'll be over by the stand if you want to come and have a chat. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew, Rebecca, and Ellis. Uh, any questions for our... Hi, thanks for your presentation. Why did you choose Amazon today, uh, as opposed to Google or all the other players out there? We as a team, we didn't choose it. Um, it has been used by Lens quite a lot, and that's what the platform available to our team was. You could use any of the other solutions if you wanted. Thank you for, thank you for all your work on this. Um, what's, what's the... Um, with Amazon, have you had to struggle with pricing and not understanding how much a, uh, a batch will, will actually cost and uh, you know, putting it back um, to the, the treasury? I'm a lowly developer, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm an amazing developer, but so we keep a close eye on our pricing and we always use spot instances. We can dial them down to smaller spot instances if we need to, so we can make the jobs die if they reach too much of a high point, but we're working on um, getting some more analytics about how much exactly a job will cost, but at the moment it's not actually a huge amount. I mean, it's really not. I could prepare it. Um, I have two questions, but one's very fast. Um, where, what's the source of the 50 centimetre satellite imagery? Uh, that was from the Earth Scanner constellation, and it was acquired through uh, Critchlow Geospatial. Uh, but all of the metadata is uh, on the layer on the LGS as to the provenance of it. Cool. Thank you. Um, can I do another question? Is that all right? Yeah. Um, uh, so just on Argo workflows, what other workflow orchestration tools did you try out, like Prefect, for example? We tried Prefect, we tried Flight, uh, Kestra, Apache Airflow, Dagster, maybe some more? Can't remember anymore. That was a few. That's a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, have you captured, like, oh, like, is there something I can look at as far as why you chose Argo workflows over those? We can share it with you, yeah. Yeah, we do have it captured. It's, uh, it's internal, but we can share it with you. Amazing, thanks. Any other questions? We've got a minute or so. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.